Not full screen. Yeah, now it's full screen. screen now? Yes, perfect. Okay, so um, so good day, everyone. Um, so let me start my uh, my presentation with a, a general introduction about how to study the collectivity of the quark-gluon plasma in heavy ion collisions. My name is Trin Shen. I'm from Wayne State University, and uh, um, so I'm a, a, a <coughs> Uh, main, main member of the uh, JSCAPE collaboration. So uh, today uh, we will use the Slack channel, uh, which is uh, in this case, uh, July 21 and July 22, Hydro uh, in your, on your Slack channel. If you haven't joined the channel, please join it now. I also put the uh, uh, information down here uh, in every slides, just in case that uh, you forget uh, which channel you want to uh, post your questions to. So we will use this channel uh, through the uh, whole uh, today and tomorrow sessions uh, for, for general questions. So I'll pause here maybe for 30 seconds uh, for, you to, for all of you to join the uh, Slack channels before we move on. Okay, now let's uh, start with the physics. So, um, so we'll start with general uh, uh, many body uh, systems. So uh, if we have a lot of particles inside the systems, usually uh, the microscopic uh, dynamics of such a bulk uh, uh, system are very different from the individual interactions between uh, individual uh, constituents. So uh, this is uh, uh, very common in our daily life. If you look at the sky, if you see a big uh, crowd of uh, birds, they will fly with uh, very different and beautiful patterns on the sky, which uh, you can, uh, which is very far from what you can imagine if you study uh, just individual birds uh, that fly in the sky. Same thing, apply, uh, same kind of uh, collective phenomena appears when you look at the a big school of fish in the oceans, or even just look at some race or bicycle race that if you have a big crowd of uh, uh, people, <coughs> they will actually uh, exhibit some different or interesting uh, microscopic uh, collective behavior. So what we like to in study uh, in terms of physics is uh, microscopically in terms of nuclei in heavy ion collisions. And uh, uh, there's a lots of particles also produced in that system, and we would expect uh, some of the many body effects emerge in that big system, in that systems. So let me begin with a uh, cartoon uh, kind of uh, numerical simulations about what happens in a heavy ion collisions. So in, in relativist heavy ion collisions, we have two uh, heavy ions accelerate to near speed of light. So uh, along the beam directions, they are uh, very uh, highly Lorentz contracted. So they look like two pancakes in the beam direction. And as, as these uh, uh, two nuclei approach to a trouser and pass through, they actually produce uh, a lot of entropy and energies uh, through the systems. And then eventually uh, the system will uh, fly apart uh, and produce thousands of particles as indicated as these red dots in these uh, animations. Inside the, uh, these high density regions, uh, they actually are very high density. It could reach to a new phase, which is quark gluon plasma phase, which we believe, and then it will evolve uh, through uh, a very strongly coupled dynamics, uh, which can be described by hydrodynamics later on. So this is not just a, a, a numerical simulation, but also if you look at uh, what is actually come out in the detector, here is an event display of the detected tracks uh, of charged particles in the CMS um, detector. And you really see that in one let, let uh, event, there's a, a ten, uh, tens of thousands of particles produced and uh, you would expect so, uh, so many particles who are actually interactive uh, together and, uh, and exhibit some uh, non-trivial or collective phenomena even in these microscopic uh, collisions. 
So, uh, so here is a, a general picture. Of what do we have think? Uh, what do we would think about of what happens in heavy ion collisions? We have the two nuclei collide with each other. After uh, a very short amount of time, the system will go through some equilibrium stage, where the uh, entropy and uh, is produced, and the particles uh, lose energies, <coughs> while uh, from their initial coming momentum, and then. Uh, after about at about like uh, three ten times ten to the minus four or twenty four seconds, uh, a, a kind of near so near thermal uh, equilibrium medium will be formed, and <clears throat> then it will actually strong interactively, uh, very very uh, it will interact very strongly, and uh, and expand uh, expand expand microscopically through the hydrogen uh, the quark and plasma phase to hydrogen gas phase. And eventually uh, falling apart into individual particles and fly to the detector. <clears throat> uh, as you can see, uh, the, the the whole heavy ion collisions will go through a multiple, uh, very complex uh, uh, stage uh, from quark gluon plasma phase, from pre equilibrium phase to QGP and the hydrogen gas phase. So, this really requires to actually uh, model. Uh, different uh, physics in different phases with different uh, uh, type of uh, physics in this case. So, so this way really requires to uh, develop a hybrid uh, theoretical framework, which can connect all these uh, uh, stages together and trying to describe the, the, the evolution of the, uh, uh, all the particles in these heavy ion collisions. And we also want to simulate them in a by event because in heavy ion collisions, there will be large fluctuations uh, from one collision to the other. And we want to also capture the fluctuations uh, in a by event through these uh, theoretical uh, simulations. Just uh, before I go into details, I also want to mention that uh, this is also uh, discussed yesterday uh, in terms of experimental observables that the heavy ion collisions uh, by itself uh, from early on has a nature of multi, has a multi messenger natures. This is very uh, similar to the multi messenger uh, cos uh, <coughs> cosmologies. So in our case, uh, we have uh, a lot of hadrons, charged hadrons and neutron hadrons produced in heavy ion collisions. They made up about 99% of the uh, stuff that can be detected in the detector for one uh, collisions. And, uh, and uh, the, the looking at uh, the, the generic patterns about the momentum distributions of all these uh, charged hadrons will tell us about the, the bulk evolutions of the system happen in these heavy ion collisions. On the top of that, we also have rare uh, probes like uh, jets, which are very high energetic, and but they are rare. Uh, they actually serve as uh, probes to actually uh, probing uh, the the uh, the properties of the mediums by looking. And so, if we can measure the the jets uh, in, in heavy ion collisions compared with uh, them in the proton proton collisions, we can learn about how the uh, presence of the hot mediums can modify their structures. And then from that, we can infer the properties of the media and how they interact with these uh, QCD objects. Uh, uh, apart from the current objects, we have also colorless objects, which is electroweak bosons, uh, which also are very high energetic. Uh, they actually are only emitted at the very early time. And then uh, through because the electromagnetic interactions with the media is very small compared to the strong interactions, they mainly will carry uh, very uh, early time information which is uh, not distorted by the presence of mediums. So by comparing uh, the uh, observables for uh, electron weak bosons compared with the QCD jets observables, we can actually understand, uh, quantify the, the medium modifications of the heart uh, of the high PT particles. And the, the electromagnetic uh, observables is not only restricted to high PT, there's also uh, radiations like thermal radiations of ENM uh, probes uh, in the, in the uh, low PT regions. And these are, are referred to thermal photons, dileptons, which radiates throughout the, uh, the whole uh, evolutions. And they actually carry complementary uh, information about the, the overall bulk dynamics compared to the majority of the hadrons. So uh, from, uh, I think from uh, like uh, the day one of heavy ion physics, we all uh, basically, uh, we, uh, the experiments measure all these type of particles. 
But as the detector become more and more precise and we have uh, more uh, high luminosity uh, collisions, uh, these rare probes like QCB jets and the true boson and EMEM radiations become more and more precise. And we are now you really enter a multi-messenger area era that we can actually quantitatively uh, describe, need to quantitatively describe all these different types of probes and the particles in these heavy ion collisions. So uh, what do we want to actually study for this uh, strongly uh, uh, hot, strongly carbon hot QCV matter is try to use the experimental data to actually quantify the transport and thermal properties of this uh, quark-gluon plasma and trying to define its properties. The, the physics uh, 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 questions what I understand about QGP is uh, what is the equation of state for this hot dense QCV matter? What's the relation between NHD density and thermal pressure or the speed of sound, which is a derivative of the pressure uh, to the energy density look like for this matter. And we also would like to know the transport properties, for example, the viscosity like shear and bulk viscosity of the fluid. And then it's diffusion constant, how the uh, conserved charge like baryon, electric charge and strangeness dissolve in the, and can, can diffuse inside this fluid as well as uh, like uh, how uh, this fluid is, uh, can shine uh, lights as well as interact with uh, colored probes. So I list some selective experimental observables uh, that are uh, usually uh, believed to be most sensitive to these uh, aspects uh, of these uh, uh, of these transport uh, and the thermal properties of QGP. But in reality, uh, they are not one-to-one -one, uh, related, but more, more uh, realistically, they are uh, very complicated, like uh, uh, connected with each other. For example, viscosity they will be sensitive to a lot of the uh, experimental observables, as well as, as if you pick one experimental observable, they will be sensitive to a lot of uh, the medium properties as well. So the real task to actually uh, extract uh, uh, physics information from data has to be go through the Bayesian analysis, which uh, you will learn uh, about in the next week of the lecture. So uh, in these uh, lectures, I will, uh, I will basically focus on a few, uh, a few aspects on this physics, uh, as, uh, on physics side, trying to give you some idea about what have been done so far in the field and what's uh, upcoming uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future. So in our field, uh, the equation state of the quark-gluon plasma has actually uh, can be computed from the first principle lattice QCD calculations. These actually help us to uh, gradually uh, significantly reduce the theoretical uncertainty in trying to determine the relation between pressure and energy density at, um, at, the, at the zero net barrier density. And there's a lot of uh, effort has been put in trying to quantify the viscosity of the quark gluon plasma by studying mainly by constraining uh, from the measurement of anisotropic flow coefficients and their correlations in the in the in the, in the, in the Edric and LHC. So mostly I will talk about uh, just uh, these uh, few aspects in the following slides. So uh, I will stop here if uh, to see if there's any questions uh, before we move on. Aisha, there's no question on Slack at the moment. And otherwise, just okay. raise Thank your you. hand if you want uh, to ask a question mm -hmm. directly here. OK. Uh, it doesn't look like no, it. I uh, think you can just. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, okay. Now we can move on. So, uh, so, so, JetScape framework is actually one of the uh, 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 of the uh, more uh, very comprehensive frameworks that actually embrace all these type of uh, probes and uh, soft dynamics together, trying to deal with these uh, multi messenger heavy ion collisions. So, it is uh, it's an open source and unified event generator, as uh, have been seen you have been seen uh, since uh, last two days. And uh, here is a, uh, a very uh, simple uh, flow chart of what uh, has been included inside the JetScape uh, uh, framework. 
So uh, there's uh, uh, initial conditions uh, connect to both uh, uh, the soft medium productions about energy density distributions at early time, as well as uh, the hot particles uh, productions for the high energy jets, as uh, they will go through different uh, physics uh, modules to uh, models to evolve uh, through this, uh, through this uh, as a function of time. And in the meantime, they will communicate with each other to exchange information. And uh, then in the end, what the uh, particle produced and it can be compared with experiments. So in today's uh, lectures, we'll mainly focus on the soft, uh, uh, soft part, which essentially is uh, we start with some initial uh, collisions and then determine the energy densities and then going through some fluid dynamic simulations to describe the bulk evolutions and then uh, convert them put into particles and then uh, they can further scatter and then eventually uh, uh, record and can be compared with the experiments. So mostly focus on, in my talk, we'll mostly focus on uh, the first uh, four box here. And the DEMA uh, on, uh, later on, we'll talk about uh, uh, the hadronic scatterings, in particular uh, in this hadron cascade uh, in, the, in the third hours of, this, uh, uh, of today's lecture. So uh, let's start with the initial uh, state of heavy ion collision. So here is a, a cartoon pictures um, that uh, describe that uh, you, as the two heavy nucleus, uh, heavy nuclei pass through each other, there's a lot of uh, scatterings will happen uh, as they uh, uh, from the individual protons inside these nucleus. So, so this uh, uh, you could expect there's a lot of multiple scatterings and, uh, and the some of them are soft and most of them are soft and some of them are hard to produce a jet. And uh, most of these processes are really highly non perturbative and cannot be calculated by uh, paper and pencil uh, with your paper and pencil uh, calculations. So it's really challenging to actually uh, understand uh, how uh, does the initial uh, energy uh, distributions look like after uh, the two nuclei pass through each other. So, so, uh, so sorry, that's sorry, why- yeah, There is a question in the chat on the initial state. I mean, maybe it's a bit too general, but still I wanted to say that there was this question that um, how, how to extract the spatial information of heavy ion collisions from experimental data. So, um, so initial, uh, so, so so there's uh, some, uh, you can, you can through, go through some uh, model simulations trying to correlate the initial state geometry about uh, say the geometry of the uh, energy density profile at early time with some experimental observable. For example, uh, one of the very good linear relation is the initial ellipticity, like the initial elmo shape of the fireball. Uh, coupled to the elliptic flow measurements in the data. So using that, you can constrain uh, the initial state uh, shape fluctuations by using uh, a spectrum of uh, anisotropic flow coefficients in the measurements. That's one of the examples that we can use. Thanks, I think this is useful. And then we can come back to this later if there's more discussion yeah. needed. So as you can see that since this is a really complicated uh, problem and also in our field, there's a zoo of initial state models, uh, which is uh, partially list here. So, um, so uh, the biggest one, usually we start with the global model, which I will explain in, the, in a minute, but there's also derivations, uh, the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, other, other ingredients that people trying to put in by different uh, either uh, through some event generators or from some uh, other type of physics like uh, uh, color glass condensate, saturation models in the high energy limit. So this is just trying to show that this is really an active uh, field that's trying to describe, develop a realistic uh, uh, initial state model for heavy ion collisions. So, so all these models sort of start from the same origin, which is a start from the spatial uh, geometry of the collisions. So uh, this is somewhat also uh, illustrated by Sang Yang yesterday, is that uh, if we have two nuclei, uh, randomly uh, sample the nucleus positions in the transverse plane indicated as the red and the green, uh, sorry, blue uh, circles in this, uh, in this uh, to, as the, as the nuclei, nucleons from these two nuclei. And then they actually uh, collide in this case at a finite impact parameter. So 
uh, by just determining geometrically uh, uh, the, how uh, the distance between the individual nuclei or according to, uh, and compare with their uh, nuclear nuclear cross sections, you can determine uh, the number of which nuclei will be uh, wounded uh, through these collisions and become a participant of uh, participating deposit energies into the fluid. And then there's also uh, open circle, all these shaded circles, uh, which uh, indicate as a spectators, which means they just, uh, they didn't participate the collision, just fly directly through without uh, any strong interactions. So these are kind of the uh, more or less the common starting point of different initial state uh, uh, models. And then a lot of different energy conditions have different assumptions about how energy is deposited through this, uh, uh, as, as these uh, participants going through uh, multiple scatterings in the early stage. So one of the, uh, of the uh, like flagship uh, initial type of condition is called IP Glasser model, which is based on color glass condensate and saturation physics. And it uh, kind of includes uh, all different types of uh, initial state fluctuations uh, that uh, we can think about in high energy collisions. So uh, at the large scales, you will have uh, fluctuations from impact parameters. Basically, when you collide uh, two nuclei, you will have uh, a different event they can collide with different impact parameter. And then the nucleons inside the colliding nuclei can actually also fluctuate. Their positions can be different from one event to the other. And inside the individual nucleons, you can you may consider sub uh, subnucleonic uh, fluctuations. For example, the nucleon is made up uh, by the valence quark and the gluons. So the quarks uh, inside the glue or inside nucleons can also have their own positions which fluctuate. Uh, from one to the other. And then you, there could be also potentially uh, fluctuations from, uh, from the color field generated from the gluons, then you can have these color charge fluctuations as well inside the uh, inside heavy ion collisions. And all these type of fluctuations generate different length scale in, in the initial conditions. And as, as you can see here, it's just a cartoon of uh, basically density distributions of uh, heavy ion collision like uranium, uranium. Uh, uh, decrease by size as you go to the left to the maybe proton to protons. And, uh, and a different type of fluctuations could uh, be uh, important uh, or more dominant in the large systems, for example, the nuclear position fluctuations compared to the, uh, the subnuclear fluctuations, which will be more, uh, more, more, more play a bigger role in the small systems. In the class class, uh, in, in addition that in the class, uh, color glass condensate framework, you don't only have uh, this uh, type of spatial fluctuation, you also have, uh, you could have also a non-zero anisotropy in the momentum space for the particle production. And, and this is mostly uh, described by these epsilon P variables is essentially uh, capture the difference uh, in the energy momentum tensor in the spatial part of energy momentum tensor in this way. So a non-zero uh, energy momentum tensor, uh, 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 momentum anisotropy can be produced when you have uh, like a color glass condensate model, when you have a color fields collide with each other and generate some non-zero momentum, already momentum anisotropy at the early time. So some of the model may have this uh, non-zero momentum anisotropy and uh, some other model may not have. And the real task is trying to have a framework that embrace uh, different type of energy conditions and studies them in the same footing and trying to understand physically what is really happening in the headline collisions. So let me stop here again if there's any questions about the uh, initial state. Yes, there was just a question. Um... Can you clarify what you mean by color charge normalization? Uh, so this is just a, a kind of a special uh, uh, fluctuations in the IP glass model where uh, the, the, the saturation scale at the local uh, position can also fluctuate that goes into normalization of this color charge. Okay. So I see no hands, but this is still your chance to raise a hand if you have a question, Kishan. Mm -hmm. So still nothing, so I think you can move on. Okay, let's move on. So 
once you have uh, the initial state uh, kind of model by some uh, models, we can actually uh, derive the systems energy of modern cancer, TMU, uh, from at the at basically uh, right after the, the two nuclei uh, uh, pass through each other. And then the system will go to some pre equilibrium stage where the system will evolve towards equilibrium through strong interactions. And this usually happens about one Fermi over C. And then it will connect to the fluid dynamics, which can describe the system's evolutions near equilibrium. And then, after, as the sense and energy density uh, become low in the system, it will actually smoothly transit to a hydronic uh, phase. And then we can use a hydron hydronic transport model to describe the individual scatterings of particles uh, microscopically, which will capture the, the dilute uh, the, the dynamic, dynamics of the dilute uh, uh, phase in the hydronic phase more realistically. So this is kind of a schematic uh, picture about how usually a hybrid theoretical framework is in, uh, to describe heavy ion collisions. So the main idea is trying to continuously connect um, the energy moment and tensor uh, from one phase to the other, so that uh, so it's uh, so it's continuous as you uh, translate uh, tra transist uh, one language to the other in your theoretical framework to describe the evolution of the system. For example, uh, from the pre equilibrium dynamics to hydrodynamics, you use the so-called Landau matching conditions with uh, the equation of state to map the initial energy moment tensor into hydrodynamic fields like energy density, pressure, and the flow velocities. At the late times, you will actually convert fluid particles uh, into uh, fluid cell into particles through so-called Cooper five particleizations, which we'll discuss in a moment. So that's kind of the general idea about how a hybrid theoretical framework is set up in heavy ion collisions. So now let's uh, talk about uh, one of the main component of this uh, hybrid uh, framework, which is uh, hydrodynamics, which will help us to discuss, uh, to, to explore the collectivities of the systems. So hydrodynamics usually can be understood as a uh, long wavelength effective descriptions of the strongly interacting system. It's mainly uh, uh, kind of depend on two ingredients. One is the conservation law of energy momentum and if you have a uh, conserved charge, there's also a charge conservation uh, equation or uh, in the equation motion. And this uh, equation needs to be solved together with a given equation state, which describe the properties or underlying matter, whether it's a water or honey or coagulant plasma. Then the, the equation state will be different for different types of fluid. But the, the conservation law you're solving uh, is exactly the same partial differential equations uh, for, for different types of fluid. So hydrodynamics is actually a, a very successful model to describe the, the microscopic features about how like star form in the galaxy in a very large scale or how the air going through some race car when you design, um, when you design the race cars uh, in the daily life and also has been applied to describe the collective behavior of the coagulant plasma in, in these heavy ion collisions. Nevertheless, we also want to say that in heavy ion collisions, because everything moves near speed of light, we already need a realistic, real, relativistic hydrodynamics, which also include viscosity, so that we can actually extract the, the transfer properties of QGT. And such of the uh, of these uh, of formulations is actually uh, is not present uh, very uh, very well in the early days, and actually. Uh, you will see that in our uh, field, there's a lot of recent development on trying to get a causal formulations of the relative fluid dynamics uh, is actually uh, in, in our field. So uh, one of the numerical realizations of such relativist hydrodynamics is uh, this uh, kind of model that I have been working with it is called music. And this is uh, first developed in the, uh, the Miguel group and uh, this is the website that hosts, uh, officially hosts the code. And it's a, it's a kind of hydrodynamic uh, code package to do 3D, 3 plus 1D simulations for heavy ion collisions in the strongly coupled phase. And today we're mainly uh, doing some exercise with this code. And then you will see uh, uh, trying to use this code to learn a little bit about the collective dynamics in the system. 
So, uh, so the equation state we are using uh, for the hot QCD is actually uh, coming from uh, the, the lattice QCD calculation. So in the in nowadays, it actually uh, it's a uh, very uh, uh, strongly constrained by the lattice QCD, uh, two different groups, hot QCD in red and uh, Wuppertal Budapest uh, group in the green uh, band. And you can see that uh, a lot of phenomenological uh, equation of state uh, are kind of the parametric fit to these lattice continuum results uh, uh, for the, uh, for example, trace anomaly as a function of temperature or speed of sound. Uh, and this is in comparison with the early days of the, uh, of the equation of state where uh, there's, uh, the continuum limit hasn't been, uh, has not been uh, uh, obtained. Uh, you can see that there's a, a dramatic uh, drop uh, of the trace anomaly uh, at the at some uh, peak temperature of 200 mV. So the maximum trace anomaly actually drops uh, by about uh, 30 percent uh, if you compare to the early days of equation state with the modern type of equation state. And then uh, the simulation of hydrodynamics uh, can be kind of a capture by uh, these equations. We are the left hand side is the, uh, the time derivative flow velocity, which is essentially the accelerations of the fluid cell. And it is equal to uh, the, the gradient, the spatial gradient of the thermal pressure divided by the system enthalpy, which is energy density plus thermal pressure. So you can interpret this equation as uh, Newton's second law uh, which where the accelerations is equal to a thermodynamic force uh, divided by the system's uh, momentum inertia. So if we solve uh, hydrodynamic equations, uh, uh, then you will see actually uh, the system's density evolutions uh, color coded as this uh, red, uh, red uh, cartoon here, and it basically expands and cools. And the system's expansion is mainly driven by the pressure gradient, which is the color difference in this density field. And it translates this uh, spatial inhomogeneity in the density profile into flow velocities that we can actually see in the later stage. We basically expand and accelerate. So, um, so this is actually a very common uh, in these strongly interactive uh, systems not only uh, in the quark one plasma phase, but also in uh, like cold atom where a system is still, again, uh, strongly coupled. And if you have a spatial inhomogeneity, then you will see that the system evolves and the expansion in the horizontal direction is much faster than the vertical directions due to the different pressure gradients. So, um, so uh, let me just uh, take uh, a few uh, uh, slides to discuss about effects of viscosities in these hydrodynamic simulations. So one, is, one of the important uh, transport coefficients of QGP that we want to quantify is the shear viscosity. The shear viscosity act as a resistance to the deformation of the system with, because it comes with these uh, gradients in different directions of flow velocity with a different structure here. So if the system want to deform into a different shape, this, the shear viscosity trying to want to stop it. So here uh, on the left, on the right hand side, I want to show you two identical initial state. And, but with simulation, one is without shear viscosity, one is with shear viscosity in the transverse plane. So, uh, so here indicate the two nucleus, one is the purple, one is the yellow uh, in the beam directions, and then just they collide, one go into the board, one go out of the board. And what is plotted here is the color is the energy density, uh, <clears throat> energy density at the initial time. The brighter, the higher energy density is. So if we evolve the systems uh, through hydrodynamics, as you can see that uh, uh, the systems uh, actually uh, has uh, more uh, fine features if you deal, if you run simulation with no viscosities. Well, with a finite shear viscosities, you can see that the system's energy density distribution become more homogeneous. So, so this is kind of uh, uh, connect to uh, our intuition that shear viscosity trying to smear out the, the different uh, difference of the systems uh, in, in, the, in the transverse plane uh, by using shear viscosities. And then we discussed that uh, the, um, the viscosity, uh, were actually, the, the hydrodynamic expansions were basically imprint everything, uh, the, the, the energy density into uh, flow patterns. And then these flow patterns were eventually 
imprint into final state momentum, uh, final state particles momentum information <coughs> and then being detected the detector. So uh, again, I can also show you the effects of bulk viscosity. So this is a different type of viscosity which acts as a scalar uh, part of the expansions. So it's basically trying to reduce the, uh, the overall scalar expansion rate of the systems. We can do the same simulations uh, through hydrodynamic code and to get intuitions. As you can see that uh, the bulk viscosity doesn't do much uh, if we compare the fine details, but you do notice that uh, uh, the system lives at a longer time with the presence of bulk viscosity and essentially to actually generate a more entropy uh, while the simulation, uh, while you have a bulk viscosity and slow down the overall expansion. So, uh, so sorry, and let me stop here if you have any question about hydrodynamic. Uh, Evolutions. So there are no hands up currently, but there was a discussion in the Slack. And I just, and there's now a new question. So let's, let me maybe read the question from the Slack. So one is, um, is there an intuitive way to learn the effect size of trace anomaly in experimental data? This was a few slides back, but still mm. maybe you can comment. Some, some people kind of, uh, some of the theoretical expectation of these trace anomaly is related to the size of bulk viscosity. So kind of where the trace anomaly peaks, we also relate to where the bulk uh, viscosity peaks. So in that sense, uh, understand how the bulk viscosity behave or there's a peak structures in the temperature may relate to, may, can, may help you can relate to the, to the trace anomaly. And also, it also relate to the speed of sound uh, in, the, in the equation state. So if you have a, a large speed of sound, you will get a large expand, larger expansions. So that's also another uh, uh, kind of indirect uh, information you can relate to this, uh, this part from experimental observables. It's not, there's no very obvious ob observer that can directly to the trace anomaly, the breaking of trace anomaly. Okay, then there's one more. Can you kindly comment how viscosity is related to other parameters such as entropy and diff diffusivity? I don't know. What so, so, so here uh, we, um, so the viscosity in this hydrodynamic simulations will generate entropy uh, during the evolutions. So if you do ideal hydro simulations, then you'll have entropy conservation. But if you include viscosity, this dissipation will generate more entropy during the evolution. So one of the things we usually look at is the particle production because more entropy means that you have more particle produced in the heavy ion collisions. Uh, however, there's also some other model parameters in the hydro uh, that uh, it's an overall normalization of energy density, which uh, avoid you to, to, to constrain the viscosity through entropy production. But uh, uh, you usually use uh, so-called anisotropic flow coefficients, which uh, which is sensitive to size of viscosity because they uh, they also erase the fine details of flow patterns that we'll discuss in a minute. So the diffusion is actually a different uh, transport phenomena compared to viscous or viscosity. So viscosity is a diffusion of energy and a momentum current. And the charge diffusion, like uh, if you have a conserved charge and it will diffuse inside fluid, then that will cause uh, so-called a diffusion constant, which describe how charge diffuse inside from in, in and out of the fluid cells. So different uh, transport uh, proper the transport coefficients. Yeah. Okay. So um, any further questions at this moment? I can't see any, so then I think you can mm -hmm. move on maybe. Okay. So uh, with, with now, uh, so the fluid dynamics uh, evolve the systems to a dilute regions, but uh, since the, uh, the detector cannot detect fluid cells, it's mostly detect particles coming from the collision. So we need to convert the fluid cell into particles, very like evaporations. If you think about fluid, it just evaporates some um, air molecules, uh, water molecules also, and they are particles. <clears throat> so, uh, so that, comes in the questions, when should we convert fluid cells into particles? And this is usually uh, questions how far, uh, also related to how far the hydrodynamic behavior should be valid in the dilute phase. 
So one of uh, the rule of thumb uh, estimation is to estimate uh, the system's microscopic scattering rate inside the fuel cell and compare with the system's overall expansion rate. So if the, uh, if the scattering rate is much larger than expansion rate, so the system keep scattering a lot, scattering a lot while the fluids are expanded, so the system would expect to be still within the equilibrium and the hydrodynamic behavior should still be valid. So when these uh, two rates become equivalent or equal to each other, uh, then, then these are really some, uh, some, some uh, time, this is really when the, the fluid dynamic descriptions expect to be uh, gradually break down. And this can be actually usually translated into a uh, fixed temperature result, which is proportional to the expansion rate divided by the scattering cross sections of the one, Q, one third. And then usually we, uh, in the practice, we just use a constant free valve temperature to, to decouple, uh, to, to basically uh, de define when the uh, fluid cell are convert, need to be converted to, into particles. And then the procedure of uh, converting uh, fluid cell into particles as uh, going through so-called Cooper-5 particleization uh, procedure, <laughs> where uh, in a nutshell is trying to conserve energy momentum from fluids, uh, fluid cell into particle samples. And this is the exact formula, how you can do it. And then I will not go through this, uh, but I think Song Yang also uh, in yesterday also described, uh, mentioned about how to sample particles from these thermal distributions in the Monte Carlo lectures. And then once the particles are sampled, you can actually feed them into hydronic transport like the RQMB or SMASH to further uh, uh, simulate uh, the decays and scatterings in the dilute hydronic phase. This will be uh, covered by Dima in details in the, in the next uh, lecture. So uh, let me also again stop here briefly if there's uh, any questions about particle free out before we go to I cannot see any at the moment. Okay, so, let me move on. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so so the experimental observables will look at what to basically look at uh, very few selective ones. Um, so uh, one of the main important one is called an anisotropic flow of coefficients. So this is basically looking at the particles momentum distributions in the transverse plane, where the, uh, the, the collisions happen in the beam direction, which is uh, going uh, perpendicular through the screen here. Uh, so every event you can see, literally you can see at the, uh, the, 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 the energy or momentum depositions is anisotropic in every heavy ion collision event. And so what you, we can do is trying to, uh, we can do a Fourier transform of these anisotropic distributions and then compute the Fourier coefficients of different uh, harmonic moments N. So these are usually called VNs and then they're, they're also associated with the angle or phase with it because uh, you can get either sine or cosine. So if you can translate into a, a VN coefficient and then a, a phase of that. So usually the V1 is called direct flow, V2 is elliptic flow, V3 is triangular flow and associated with this different shape of the geometry. So uh, in heavy ion collisions, these can be measured and they can form a power spectrum, like very similar to the fluctuating uh, fluctuation power spectrum in the cosmic microwave background. Uh, so in the, in the big bands where uh, this uh, map is actually a constant play probe uh, very, with very good precisions, uh, then we can do a, a kind of power spectral analysis to get the harmonic moments or these multiple moments uh, from the, from the uh, CMB. Uh, in, in our case, uh, this, uh, we cannot measure every event very precisely due to the finite number of particles. So uh, what do usually have your ion collisions you can do is to collide multiple collisions in trying to measure uh, precisely the average or the fluctuations of these coefficients uh, from, from the measurements. And then there's uh, similarly, they also form a power spectrums as, as a form, an order from, uh, from, from two to higher order. And compared with the, uh, the harmonic order in the uh, spectrum in the CMB, we only can have non-zero values at the very low uh, harmonic orders, indicating there's a very big uh, viscous uh, dampings in the, uh, which damps out all the higher order moments in the heavy ion collisions. So compared to the early universe, our system is uh, more viscous. <clears throat> However, but we still can use 
uh, the few uh, moments that can be accessible from say, two to seven uh, to actually constrain uh, the initial uh, spec fluctuation spectrums of the initial state, uh, how it fluctuates in shape, and also what's the uh, sub, uh, small scale fluctuations we are when we look at uh, uh, these uh, harmonics uh, uh, as a whole. So, uh, so such of the framework can be actually uh, actually use apply to do this simulation and then try to describe these uh, harmonic, uh, these anisotropic flow coefficients. One of the framework we have been carried out is trying to look at systematically how one framework can actually describe the elliptic flow coefficients for different types of systems at different collision energies. Here is sure. one of the studies that sure. have been done. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, before you uh, go into more details, maybe yeah, there's a more general question on these Fourier expansions. So why do we yeah. use a Fourier expansion to extract the coefficients of flow harmonics? Are there, may I use other expansions as well? Yeah, you can. That's, that's, uh, uh, that's basically a, a kind of, uh, as long as you explain a complete basis, that's all your freedom to do. Uh, I think the, the way to pick, the, the reason to pick a Fourier trend, uh, coefficient, uh, trend, uh, expansion is kind of, it's kind of well known. And uh, um, so what we also found is that these VNs has a very good linear relationship, at least for V2 and V3 with initial shape. So if you do a different uh, uh, mode like expansions, you might don't get the very good linear intuitions with the, with the, uh, with the shape uh, decompositions. It could be a little bit more complicated to to fish out the physics, but it's uh, as long as a complete basis, it's it's uh, it's well it's well uh, you can you can do it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, just trying trying to show that one of the hyper model uh, with uh, with one single set of parameters can actually achieve a quantitative descriptions of of the these VN coefficients from large to small system and the different collision energies. And the one of the, uh, of the uh, extensive uh, uh, studies carried out by the JSCAP uh, collaboration recently is trying to use all the available experimental measurements to do a global constraint on and trying to extract the, the transport uh, the viscosities of the coagulum plasma. Uh, and this is a highlight of the, what we have been uh, using with this uh, particle multiplicity, mean PT and anisotropy flow coefficients. And then you can extract the transport uh, properties on the right hand side, which uh, which you can see uh, the the prior distributions in from before the constraint is indicated as this gray area, and then after the model constraint to these experiments, we get the, the orange uh, part. So as you can see that the uh, the experimental data used in here actually have a strong uh, constraining power of the value of shear viscosity in temperature between 150 and 200. And also it constrain the bulk viscosity as well in these uh, low temperature regions. And we would expect this is a very a systematic uh, constraints that uh, actually uh, take into account a lot of uh, degrees of freedoms in the model. And we try to use multiple data to constrain these uh, observables. And this will be discussed uh, in full details in the next week's lectures. And uh, last but not least, let me also try to advertise that if you want to build your own intuitions about what model parameters does uh, to different type of experimental observables, there's a, a JSCAP widget, which we build up through these uh, numerical simulations. And this actually will help you. You can actually adjust, uh, go to this website, adjust the parameter yourself, and you can uh, visually see uh, how the experimental observable changes. Uh, due to the exchange of your parameters. I think this is a very good tool for you to actually build up your own intuitions about uh, uh, what physics uh, uh, parameters does uh, to, the, to the experiment of levels. Okay, let me stop here before I go to the next topic. Again, I don't see any questions and I think we need to move okay. on there like 10 okay. minutes That's now just on. for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. So, um, so now let me talk about a little bit on the kind of future directions. So it's most, most on the more kind of frontier uh, side of heavy ion collisions. So uh, mainly we we'll talk about so far is uh, trying to look at high energy collisions. We are, we are probing 
the property of the quark gluon plasma at the high temperature limit. Uh, uh, and there's also another directions that nowadays people uh, pursue uh, because you can see there's a, a lot of experimental programs uh, trying to actually go into the low energy conditions. One of the goal is trying to probe the phase diagram in, in terms of another directions, which is the finite chemical potentials. As you go to lower energies, you actually not probing the high temperature limit, but also at the, but at the finite temperature, uh, finite chemical potentials. And trying to map out the phase diagram in these two dimensions for quark gluon plasma is one of the primary goal of the heavy ion collision program in the current stage. And what I want to what I want to search for is whether there's a critical point and whether we can locate the, the starting uh, the, the location of a critical point and it's a first order phase transitions in this QCD phase diagram and also trying to understand how does the transport property of the quark gluon plasma changes if you have a finite chemical potentials and also uh, you can access a new, new, new transport coefficients like charge diffusion coefficients in the low energy run simulations. As you want to go to low energies, there's a lot of challenge in, exper in the theoretical descriptions. One is that uh, as you go to low energies, the Lorentz contraction between the two nuclei become not big anymore. You cannot approximate as uh, two very thin pancakes, but they have a finite size in the longitudinal directions you need to take into account. And this what leads to a finite uh, passing time uh, for the two nuclei to go through each other. And you really need to describe what happens in these uh, of these overlapping time because they can easily grow to like three Fermi for these two nuclei to pass through each other at an order of 10 GeV collision energy. And this make about like one third of the uh, whole entire Earth's dynamical simulation of the lifetime fireball. <clears throat> so over the time, a uh, few years, past few years, there's a lot of different types of models trying to go beyond this so-called Joachim paradigm where the two nuclei understand approximately as two thin sheets collided with each other and uh, taking into account the finite interactions between, uh, between them and why they pass through each other. So, so really as, as these two go through each other, you really need to also uh, initialize hydrodynamics uh, at different time for different positions. So this is usually called the uh, dynamical initialization scheme, where as the two nuclei pass through each other, you continuously feed the hydrodynamic fields with energy moment source terms as well as uh, charge source <clears throat> as they evolve. So one of the uh, of the simulations look like this. You have, uh, for example, at 19.6 GeV, you have two nuclei uh, passing through each other. Right after that, you have a phase that uh, people, uh, the nuclei start to deposit energies. And after that, it's actually expand in three dimensions as, as the system goes on. So this is a, a, a kind of a new kind of uh, view about heavy ion collisions as you go to lower energies. Uh, we can also map some into the QCD phase diagram. So we can look at a different time where does the fireball uh, located in these phase diagrams through these numerical simulations. So here uh, there are three different uh, kind of time scales where things happen differently. So at the, uh, at the first uh, one or two Fermi, the system will actually have uh, the two nuclei overlap and then they will continuous deposit energy momentum into the system. As you can see, the red blob start to uh, first increase the temperature and also uh, go into the finite chemical potential regions where uh, you, you can understand this is uh, in the baryon charge stop, start to dope into the systems. So the system become at the finite chemical potential. After two nuclei pass through each other, the system will expand in 3D. And this is the trajectories that actually the fireball will go through as a function of time from maybe two to five from. After that, the system will go to really near the, uh, the, <coughs> the hydronic phase where you can actually uh, start to transist, uh, kind of convert a lot of fluid cells into particles and then feed into hydronic transport. And, uh, so and we have like five minutes the, the, now. Yeah, thanks. So uh, if you look at the, the fireball at the finite uh, large uh, rapidity regions, you will actually see that the fireball is probing a different chemical potential and temperature regions indicated as these blue uh, blobs here. So, so from the numerical simulations, from these hyper simulations, you really can map heavy ion collisions event by event into the phase diagram 
and trying to study how uh, different collision energies, different centralities map into these phase, how they explore the QCD phase diagram in terms of temperature and chemical potentials. Yeah, let me stop briefly here. I only have two more slides uh, to go before ending. If we have any questions. I don't see any at the moment. Okay. So, so, uh, so next we'll be really looking at uh, the near future where uh, let me come back to these things of multi-messengers because uh, as you have heard uh, yesterday by Raghav and Laura, that uh, there's a lot of uh, experimental upgrades <clears throat> in at RIC and LHC, which is really aimed to actually uh, to, to, to gain uh, high statistics uh, for the real probes like jets uh, uh, and also heavy quark states to probe the inner structures of the quark gluon plasma. And also there's uh, upcoming experiments uh, in the low energy frontier to probe the QCD phase diagram and also uh, EIC to, uh, to look at the initial state of the heavy uh, of the nucleons and nucleus. So really this kind of, we are looking at uh, in the near future is really going to a multi-messenger uh, physics where we look at different types of observables with the high precisions and trying to use them to actually further constrain the, the properties of quark gluon plasma. And then the need of uh, on the theoretical frame here is trying to have a unified uh, framework or trying to actually embrace all these type of physics. And this is the next big project of Jscape collaborations, which is the Xscape uh, project, which has this uh, concept uh, flow chart here. Uh, which actually trying to embrace all these different type of uh, physics uh, that <clears throat> that will be uh, coming in the next uh, five to ten years in the, in the in the in the experiments. So now let me end here. So I want to say that the the, the vibrant experimental programs at the RIC and Chiefs really drive this drive our field to a very precision area, and we really need to have a unified uh, theoretical framework trying to. Uh, to, to, to basically cover all of these aspects of heavy collisions. And uh, I mainly focus on the relativist hydrodynamics or the soft dynamics. And I want to convince you that hydrodynamics is really a effective and efficient uh, framework to describe the dynamic evolution of the quark gluon plasma in heavy ion collisions. It takes into, uh, take directly the first, in, first principle input from that is QCD. It makes a lot of uh, quantitative uh, successful predictions in the experimental observables. And um, importantly, that the model parameter you constrain in this model has a direct connections to the physical properties of the quark gluon plasma that you want to study. But that's all I have. Uh, if, uh, if there's any more questions, I can take more questions. Thank you, Shun, for this nice uh, introduction and overview. And, um... Yeah, that's the opportunity for more questions if there are any. So either raise your hand or vote something into the chat, uh, into the Slack, sorry. So I see some clapping. No hands so far, but I, I noticed somebody, I think there will be, was something in the Slack? Not yet. Maybe I can add, if anybody wrote a question in the stack and they felt that it was not fully answered, it would be a good time to ask as well. Yeah, that's oh, we a can good point. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> for majority, we can have uh, like five, five minutes break. You can also ask me questions during the break. <laughs> yeah, we don't have, the, we don't have to stick. Everybody don't have to stick around if they want a break. Okay, so then let's let's uh, wait. I think there is some activity on Slack coming. They're just writing, so it takes a moment until the mm -hmm. questions are sure. there. Um, but then, uh, so whoever needs a few minutes break, we'll we'll start with the next part at five past ten for Eastern Standard. Right? <clears throat> So I think there's one question concerning the uh, improving the constraints on bulk viscosity. So what should be improved on the experimental mm -hmm. side? So what's the observables that can help to determine bulk viscosity better? Any idea? Um, that's like hard to hard to say because um, 
uh, one thing I think to me is kind of um, like uh, so. So there are a few few experimental observables that is like sensitive to the um, to the bulk viscosity. In the patient analysis, mainly used is just uh, identify particle in PT. And in JustScape, we also now are writing a paper on <clears throat> trying to use uh, heavy particles like uh, deuterons, which were actually more sensitive to the radio flow in the heavy ion collision. So that will actually uh, impose some uh, con additional constraint <clears throat> on the bulk viscosity compared to just using uh, the, the light flavor hadrons. Another observables coming to mind is uh, the HPT radii, because uh, as you can see from the movie, the bulk viscosity not slow only slowing down the, the profile, uh, the, the expansion, but also make the lifetime of the fireball become longer. So by looking at uh, the HPT radii in different directions, you will see uh, different the radii will have different sensitivity to the lifetime of the fireball. So that that also a a a. a <clears throat> Yeah, observables that can be used in the, in the upcoming Bayesian analysis to, to set constraint on the on the bulk viscosity. Yeah, maybe as a more as a comment, course, yeah. but that you, you could also go maybe to lower beam energies also, right? That could also help if you include more yeah. beam energies. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, you give you different weights on the temperature, uh, on the temperature access. Uh, uh, so, so then they would get different different uh, uh, can constrain the shape of the bulk as a function of temperature. So now we have a hand up by Tribu Ban Parida. So if you want, you can just speak. Yes, thank you. So while constraining the shear viscosity and bulk viscosity from uh, data-like elliptic flow, mean PT, and uh, uh, total multiplicity like this kind of thing, so at that time, uh, are you fixing all other parameters like uh, the initial time of hydro tau naught? No, so they are all variation. So so everything is by uh, is varying. So it's a seventeen dimensional uh, model parameter space. We uh, simultaneous vary. Uh, so that that's the power of, of the Bayesian analysis. So that uh, you don't need to fix uh, certain model parameters and only vary a few of them but you can vary all of them together and then derive a more robust constraint on the, on the, on the bulk and shear viscosity through this analysis. Okay, so there should also so be- Of course, it's uh, not manageable by hand, but uh, the patient analysis give you a way to, to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there should also be a band on result temperature initial time. Yeah, also yes, yes, time. yes. We have, yeah, so we have all the details in the paper. Uh, if you want to see, yeah, all, all, all of them have uh, some uh, likelihood uh, uh, distributions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think apart from this uh, question here in the uh, live session, we had one in the chat, but uh, in the Slack, but I think this is more a technical question, maybe already related to the next session. So. Uh, it's about running simulations and technical details. Mm -hmm. So I, I think maybe this sure. is more uh, more addressed to the next part. So I think with that, then we'll, we'll quit this uh, first part of the presentation mm -hmm. and uh, just continue with the hands-on session for the hydrodynamics part. Sure. So I'm going to lead you through, I think. <laughs> and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you can just start the hands-on mm -hmm. session from here. So I will stop and start the recording. So wait a second before you really start.